Hello again and welcome to another edition of Newsmaker of the Week. I'm Leon Warden and I am pleased to welcome this week's Newsmaker, Congressman Buck McCann. Thank you, Leon. Thanks, Thanks for, for joining us. Me. Good to be with you. Well, you know, it is a pleasure to have you here. I was just thinking, you know, your district is so large, goes all the way out to the Nevada border. I'm surprised you can get from one end to the other now with, with the gas prices being what they are. Uh, <laughs> well, that is that is a problem, isn't it? You know, yesterday we, uh, we held a press conference talking about gas prices. And I remember uh, during the last election, uh, leading up to the election, Ms. Pelosi, who is now the speaker, uh, had numerous speeches where she said if the Democrats would be given the majority, they would be able to lower gas prices. Did she say that? She is now the speaker. They've had the majority for about a year and a half now. Yeah, we have her speeches. Uh, I can quote them. <laughs> by, uh, but um, in a year and a half now since she's been the speaker, gas prices have doubled. And people say, well, you know, what, would the, what is the Democrat plan? We've been asking them, what is the plan? We're waiting for it. And what is the Republican plan? You know, uh, the Democrat plan to lower gas saving prices, let me, let me just go over some of those with you, the Democrat plan and the Republican okay. plan, because we are back in election There's mode a plan? again. There is a plan. The Democrat plan was to sue OPEC. That provided no savings. They also have had seven investigations into price gougers, resulted in no savings. They've had four investigations into speculators, which has resulted in no savings. And they passed an energy bill which involved no new energy, uh, net energy, mm -hmm. and, and had a $20 billion tax cost on that. What, it would have replaced current replaced, energy with yeah. like wind farms and stuff? Yeah, or? focus on, uh, on uh, renewable mm -hmm. energies. Uh, wind farms, uh, solar, which are which are good things to do, mm -hmm. but no net new increase in energy. Right. Uh, and 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 like I said, that was a twenty billion dollar tax hike to carry out that energy plan, which didn't become law. Okay. Uh, and then they also wanted to halt shipments into the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, which is something that we did in a joint way a resolution that we sent to the president and he has halted those uh, reserves and that should save about five cents a gallon but it's been going up so fast it it just disappears five into cents the, doesn't seem like very much right now let me tell you the republican plan we think that uh, we should be able to bring onshore oil online now that's talking about drilling in the anwar mm -hmm. drilling in the in place where we have shale oil reserves, Montana, Wyoming, uh, Utah, uh, that would result in a savings of from 70 cents to $1.60 a gallon. We also think that we should be able to bring deep water oil online, that's drilling like 50 miles off our shore mm -hmm. and bringing that uh, into, the, into the program. That would result in a savings of from 90 cents to 250 a gallon. We also think we should bring new refineries online. We haven't had a refinery built in this country since 1976. New refineries could bring a 15 to 45 cent a gallon savings. There was some talk about cutting earmarks, taking a break from earmarks for the summer and reducing the federal gasoline tax for the summer. That would be an 18 cent a gallon savings. Mm -hmm. And then finally, the thing that we joined together on to halt the shipments to the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, and that saved a nickel. That would result in a savings a minimum, talking on the lower end, the 70 cents, the 90 cents, not the $1.60 or the 250, a minimum savings of $1.98 a gallon. We're up now to, well, here in California. Over four uh, bucks. Over four bucks for regular. Yeah. And uh, then you add another 20, 30 cents for, uh, for premium. Uh, so that would cut that from four to less than two uh, at a minimum. And somebody says, well, you know, why didn't you do it? You had the majority for a while. We did. We, we passed that. And, and somebody else said, well, it would take uh, 10 years to get that oil on, on you know, in, if mm -hmm. you start now, take 10 years before we really realize the savings. 10 years ago, we passed that, we sent it to the president, and President Clinton vetoed it. So we have been trying, and, and we have the, the plan, we have the resolve. 
uh, we need to be given another chance to uh, to have a shot at the majority to show what we what we could and would do. But isn't that just a short-term solution? I mean, oil is a finite is. resource. Isn't it, it is. There is no question. And anybody that thinks that talking about drilling in the Anwar or drilling offshore uh, more oil is going to save save us, it isn't. We need to do um, renewables. We need to do conservation. Uh, we need to do uh, nuclear. You know, France gets about 60% of their energy from nuclear. Mm -hmm. We have the technology now to do it, and we can do it where it's environmentally friendly. We get like environmentally safe. something like that, right? It's uh, like next to nothing. Yeah, yeah. We, we probably get as much from that as we do from wind, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so we need to do all of these things. We can't pick and choose and say we can conserve our way out of it. We can't, and we can't get off of oil overnight. Mm -hmm. It's going to take some time, but but to be buying oil from Saudi Arabia, and from Venezuela, and from Iran, mm -hmm. uh, you know, countries that have have uh, said that we're enemies and they want to destroy us, just doesn't make any sense. You know, to be putting dollars in our enemies' pockets to turn around and let them uh, buy weapons or drugs or. Uh, build their uh, IED bombs that they're using in Iraq to, mm -hmm. to, to kill our people it just does not make yeah, any sense. What about sense. that whole war for oil thing? I mean, didn't we go <laughs> to, <laughs> to drive down? You know, I remember five years ago when we went to war with Saddam Hussein. You know, I think we were complaining about oil at 50 bucks a barrel. Now it's, you know, could you have seen five years, you know, that five years later is going to be $140 a barrel? Well, it didn't go from 50 to 100. It, it, it kind of stayed there, but in the last year, mm -hmm. two years, it has gone up. I mean, in the last six months, it, it's just it. I, I, every day, it goes up five bucks, ten bucks. When you're looking at that price that we're paying for crude, and figuring the problems we have with not adequate refineries, and and then different refineries because California has tougher standards, and, mm -hmm. and we have to have different kind of boutique refineries to handle the oils in. Uh, to convert to the gasoline in California market, it's uh, it 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 boggles my mind thinking of where's it going to be. It, I mean, if you don't fill up today, tomorrow it could cost you ten cents a gallon more. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is crazy. Yeah, yeah. And so at some point, I I just saw a poll. In fact, that uh, the majority of people now understand the the supply and demand concept. They understand that oil is not the solution, but it's the it's the it's got to fill in the gap mm -hmm. until we put our ingenuity to work. You know, when JFK said uh, after the Russians put Sputnik up there, he said we're going to beat them to the moon. There were a lot of naysayers. There were a lot of people who said we couldn't do it, we shouldn't do it. Why would we do this? And they were working with slide rules, mm -hmm. and we beat them, and we put a man on the moon. And Americans, if we will work together. If we will, if we will put these uh, petty differences aside, I think are petty differences. If we come together as Americans, which we did for about a week after 9/11, we could solve these problems. You know, I, you mentioned California. California, I guess, is leading the way with more fuel-efficient, you know, requirements for more fuel-efficient cars. And that's too. another thing that should be done. And and we did pass a bill, and I give the Democrats credit for that. We did it in a bipartisan way that increase the cafe standards on cars. We need to do that. The market will take care of a lot of that. People are not going to be buying big gas guzzlers if they're paying four or five dollars a gallon for gas. Mm -hmm. But so you, we can do some of that legislatively. I think the market will have a big say on that. And I think people are moving quickly, manufacturers are moving quickly to hybrid cars, to, to other type of uh, cars that get a, a lot better mileage. All of those things we need to do. We can't do one thing and think that's going to solve it all. It's a broad problem that needs a broad solution. But it's going to take everybody coming together at the table and, and working on it. You can't say, well, uh, I, we can't drill in the Anwar. That's off the table. We can't uh, do exploration. That's off the table. We can't do nuclear. That's off the table. I mean, you know, when you start eliminating all of these things, um, then, then say fine. Yeah, you know, you mentioned the uh, Democrats 
uh, bill investigating I, price gouging. And I, you know, I was thinking there, there are probably a lot of people who think that you know gas station owners are price gouging. But from what, what I understand, a lot of the independent gas station owners are you know starting to go out of business. A, a lot of them that have the old technology in their pumps can't even increase the price over three ninety nine a gallon. Oh, is that right? Yeah, we got to find an old gas station. It's locked in. <laughs> well, the, they won't be around long because. Uh, I, I, as I mentioned, we did this uh, press conference yesterday at a local gas station, mm -hmm. um, and I was talking to the owner, Randy Kressel, and I, I said, you know, there's, there is a lot of talk about gouging and, you know, you guys getting rich. I said, how much, how much do you make on a gallon of gas? He's, it varies from two cents to one cent to losing a cent. Because he's tied in with a car wash. He loses money on the gas, but he makes his money on the car wash. Right. And so he, he keeps his prices down below everybody else. Mm -hmm. And and if you if you buy a car wash, he sells it to you for lower than that. Right. And and that's where he actually ends up losing on the gas. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it's not a situation that uh, that they're making a lot of money. The gas stations that have very high volume. His would be probably a moderate volume station, but he was telling me of another one that does like two and a half times the volume he does. Mm -hmm. So they get a little better price break when they buy it. Mm -hmm. So they can either sell it for a penny or two less mm -hmm. and, and keep their profit margin about the same and would be actually a little bit higher because of the volume. Or they can uh, lower their prices you know, and, and pass the savings on. Either way, uh, a gas station owner is not making a lot at the pump. They mm. might, you know, make it on their candy bars or hot dogs or something that they're selling now in their convenience stores, which is something that 20, 30 years ago was unheard of. Mm -hmm. But but that's, I mean, gas stations, when I was a kid, were called service stations. And uh, Johnny Drake, where we used to go up and buy our gas for 25 cents a gallon, would come out, wash the windows, pump the gas, and... Uh, it's totally changed, totally changed. They, they all have convenience stores, and they have to have that to, to pay for the, you know, to pay for what they're selling gas for. Right. It doesn't matter. It, the important thing to us is we're paying over four bucks a gallon for gas, and if you have a, a, a car that uh, gets 20 miles a gallon, uh, and you're driving, you know, 400 miles. That's costing you a lot of money every week. And so people, I, I, I think I'm seeing a little less traffic on the roads, but people still have to get to work. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did a, a town hall meeting the other night, telephone town hall, you know, where we call people. And, and, I, and I do that periodically. I've done several of them. And, and I, I can have hundreds of people on the phone at a time, and, and I track what people are really interested in. Yeah. Every one. Everyone for a few years, the number one topic was illegal immigration. Mm -hmm. This week, not even close. <laughs> gas, gas prices, gas price, and it's supply and demand. If we don't get increase the supply, we're going to be paying probably five, six dollars a gallon uh, before the end of the year. Besides, the illegal aliens can't afford the gas to get all the way up here. On that note, I want to take a quick break, and when we come back, I want to talk about two environmental issues that you're involved with. Great. Every trip, every time, buckle up so you and your friends get home safely. Seatbelts save lives. Okay. Visit NHTSA.gov. That is spectacular advice. Hi, this is Louis Gossett Jr., and you're watching SCV-TV, the Santa Clarita Valley Television, right here.
Welcome back. We're here with Congressman Buck McKeon, and I mentioned that we wanted to talk about some environmental issues. And you know, I was thinking about the you know the Democrats' plan for gas and the Republicans' plan for gas. But there's one case where your name and Barbara Boxer's name shows up in the same place, and that's on this new wilderness bill. Actually, two different places: you in the House, she in the Senate. Right. What is this? It's all the capital. Uh, you know, my district goes up now to uh, up above Bridgeport. I have all of Inyo County, all of Mono County, half of San Bernardino County. So I have Death Valley, I have all the Eastern Sierra. There is a, a big interest in the northern part of the district uh, to have a wilderness bill. Mm -hmm. And Barbara Boxer had been working on one that was going to be a very large area of the district going into wilderness. When uh, I was elected in, in 2002 in the new district, uh, as I visited with people up there, I found there was a lot of interest, uh, both from people that wanted access to areas and people that wanted to close down access or, mm -hmm. you know, have more wilderness area. And we've been working ever since on trying to get the local people to come to consensus as to where we could come out with a bill that people would be would feel like it would be a good a good bill. Mm -hmm. Now, we've done that, uh, and. Um, we introduced the bill last Thursday. Mm -hmm. Senator Boxer introduced it in the Senate. I introduced it in the House, both at the same time. We have been working very closely on this, and uh, I'm sure she's getting some heat from some of her uh, backers that it doesn't go far enough, and I'm getting heat from some of my backers that it goes too far. But um, we, we held a, a news conference up uh, in Bishop last week and we had people from up there, you know, that spoke on the bill. We just had a, a news conference today up on uh, Bear Divide, uh, going over the mm -hmm. the pass from Sand Canyon over into the uh, Tahunga area, and uh, explained the bill. What we're trying to do it it puts about 470,000 acres in the White's Mountains and along the Eastern Sierra, and actually down here in. Uh, Magic Mountain, not the not the theme park, not the amusement park, right. but on the east side of the valley, east of uh, Sand Canyon, there is a mountain, Magic Mountain, and there's about 12,000 acres around that mm -hmm. that uh, that are in this bill that would become wilderness. It, there, it's a condor habitat. And as we were standing there on Bear Divide talking about this, we had a flyover mm -hmm. of six condors in formation. First time in my life I've seen a condor. Flying in the wild. Very cool. It was it was uh, it was amazing. Don't they look like big turkey vultures? They just look like a big big black bird, <laughs> and that's why I, I say I think I've seen turkey vultures, uh, but not a condor ever. Yeah, I wouldn't be sure if I'd seen a condor or a turkey vulture. Well, they're, they're, they're a little bigger. higher, yeah. and the fact that they were all flying together. Apparently, there are twelve of them that live in this area, mm -hmm. and then a little. Um, Further to the east, about 30 miles further, we have another area that's about 28,000 acres, Pleasant View Ridge, that is also a very important. That's out by Devil's uh, Punch Bowl, right? On the yes. Antelope Valley? Yeah. Yes. Uh, kind of in the, it's in the uh, Angeles National Forest between the Antelope Valley and the uh, La Cañada, La Crescenta, oh, okay. over that way, you know, right, where that right. road comes yeah. across. So um, that bill has been introduced. It also provides for wild and scenic river designation, which is very important to fishermen and, and people that want to preserve the uh, the rivers. We do the the Piru Creek, mm -hmm. uh, the Upper Owens River, and uh, Amargosa River out in uh, in Death Valley. So, I think on balance, it's it's a it's a very good bill. Still in the White Mountains, there are people that still have motorized access that can get into mm -hmm. the uh, into the mountains and and and. But see all the th this see the is, things there. You say this is 470,000 acres, and it's all it's all national. You know, it's all owned by the federal government. It's not. It doesn't affect Currently, anybody's yes. private property. Right. But, but so, right. what does the wilderness designation do? It uh, it precludes entrance in it with a motorized vehicle. Okay. So uh, off roaders don't go into that part. But we've preserved a lot of area where they can still go in and uh, and. And we didn't close down any roads, lots of area where they can still uh, 
enter. And so they, people could still fish and hunt and hike oh, yeah. and all that yeah. kind of stuff. Oh yeah. But they wouldn't be able to do things like mining. Uh, right. But I understand that if it's like if it's a, currently allowed, it could continue, but there can't be any new mining. Correct. Or something like that. Correct. And also, we we preserve for uh, snowmobilers. There's an area where they use now, but but it could have been shut off at any time. About eleven thousand acres up in the in the top part of this area. Yeah. For snowmobile access in the in the winter. I understand that's a big deal because there's a lot of people who. I mean, it might not mean much to people down here where it's like a thousand degrees, but up in the northern. I've parts been on of a snowmobile district. one time. I understand but there are lots lot of, of people. people who like That's this how thing. they recreate. And you're taking that away from them by this wilderness bill, aren't you? We're, we're putting it, we're guaranteeing that it will be preserved. They're here it's, and they're, and, okay. Yeah. No, they it's, get their it's own there. space. It's 11,000 yeah, 11, yeah. acres, yeah. And they have access to it and it will be in the in legislative language. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, there was a, a bill passed in the 70s that set aside a lot of land for a wilderness study area that may later be turned into wilderness area. Mm -hmm. That land has been in limbo. It's been kind of uh, governed as wilderness land, but it wasn't actually wilderness mm -hmm. uh, for 30 years. And one of the criteria people, when I first started meeting with them, some of them wanted to have some of those lands released mm -hmm. from that designation. And we have over 50,000 acres in this bill of released wilderness study areas. Mm -hmm. First time that's ever happened. Uh, I think the largest release prior to this time was like 6,000 acres. So this is a, uh, and that was a, like I say, there's balance and uh, very, very important. Yeah. I don't see Diane Feinstein's name here. Where is she in all this? I, I, I haven't talked to her about it. I, I would think she would be very supportive. Mm -hmm. uh, as I said, we just introduced the bill Thursday. Uh, we just got a number for the bill. I think it's 6156. We got that Friday. Um, when I get back, uh, we've been on the Memorial Day break this week, so mm -hmm. I, I go back Monday, and my thing I'm going to really focus on is getting co-sponsors and getting these bills passed into the president's desk this year. Yeah. You know, I, I did a show recently that had to do with the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy and the Rim of the Valley Trail mm -hmm. Corridor. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this, um, they had a bill that the president signed a couple of weeks ago that would... Uh, you know, set up a study. a study to see whether the National Park Service should have authority over this land or something like that. And, and I understand you voted against that. Why, why was that? Uh, I, have, I had some concerns, uh, you know, the ultimate and where that would be, what lands would be drawn into that. And, and uh, you know, a study is, is one thing. And, and I talked to Adam Schiff, who was the sponsor of the bill. And, and, and he and I worked out kind of an agreement. I didn't openly go out and fight it or, or anything. Mm -hmm. I, I did vote against it. Uh, but, uh, but I think he, he's a, a serious guy, and, and, and I think he, it's an issue more involving his district than mine, although ours would probably be Taking involved. Taking some of that Rim of the Valley yeah. Trail. And so I, I think that uh, I'm anxious to see what the study shows, and then we'll decide going forward. The other major piece of legislation has to do with Semex and, and mining in Soledad Canyon, which, you know, pretty much everybody here in the Santa Clarita Valley and then parts of the Antelope Valley have been pretty excited about now and, for And a now while. Victor Valley. And now Victorville is excited in a different way. Tell right. me about what this bill would do. Uh, the bill, uh, you know, uh, a contract was let between the BLM and Southdown to mine for aggregate in the Agua Dulce Canyon country area mm -hmm. in 1990. Uh, this area has been fighting it for at least the last 10 years. For the first several years, it was kind of like underground. We didn't really know what right. was going on. Uh, in the course of that that transaction, Southdown sold out to Semex. Mm -hmm. Semex has been a, a better neighbor than Southdown was. Southdown tried to just steamroller it through. Mm -hmm. And uh, Semex has been more interested in, in working with the, with the community. Um, for several years now, we've been trying to resolve this issue. You know, the, we, we got a, a truce a little over a year, a year and a half ago between the city and Semex. They were both spending a lot of money uh, fighting and Suing each other and, and saying so nasty forth. things about each other. And all right. That. And, and, it, and we got that tampered down, and then we got people talking mm -hmm. together. 
And what we finally resolved is uh, the bill says the mine will go away, will not be mined forever in that area. So the, so the BLM can't relet those leases? In our bill, area. that precludes that. When I met okay. with the secretary, Secretary Kempthorne, Secretary of Interior, who's mm -hmm. over the BLM, he, he thought that was a good idea too. You know, why would you want to start over with this fight uh, somewhere right. Not down allow down. one company to do it, but allow another company right. to do it later. Okay. Right. Uh, because it wasn't the company, it was the, the, the reason the people fought it was the traffic, the pollution, the taking down of a mountain. Right. Uh, so what, we, what, what the bill does after all of this negotiation and working it out, the mine goes away. Mm -hmm. Semex, however, is on the hook for the money they've spent for the potential profit that they would have made. Right. And, uh, and they still have the contract with the BLM to pay them so much money, so they have to be made whole. Uh, we found another piece of land, mostly in my district, there's a little piece of it in Jerry Lewis district, up mm -hmm. near Victorville, mm -hmm. that the city of Victorville has been trying to uh, develop in their master plan. They have some good ideas for it. They're, Victorville and Santa Cruz are two of the fastest growing areas in the state. Right. And that so, land in Victorville is owned by the federal government. BLM. And they had been trying to get that land. This mm -hmm. would help facilitate it. So the bill takes the land in Victorville, gives mm -hmm. it to Semex. Semex is made whole, mm -hmm. and they leave. That makes Santa Cruz happy, no mine. Makes Semex happy. Now then, Victorville owns the land. They can then sell it, work out a deal with a developer, and continue with their master plan of developing their city. Right. So all three of them parties are, are in alignment. Um, I have talked to the chairman of the uh, Resources Committee, which has some major jurisdiction. I've talked to George Miller, who's the number two guy. I've talked to the, the Republicans, who are the ranking members, you mm -hmm. know, and I've, and I've been building good support. I just found out uh, a couple days ago that they also referred the bill to the Ways and Means Committee, and that's going to complicate it. But uh, uh, I mentioned earlier, I said bills. Mm -hmm. There are two bills that my goal is to get them finished up this year, right. uh, signed into law, President's we're, desk. That would take care of the Semex problem, and it would take care of the yeah. wilderness bill. And I apologize, we're out of time, just have 30 seconds left. I think a couple of years ago you told me that in order to get the action on, on Semex, we were going to need support of the BLM in this. Where do you see them ultimately coming down in this? I, I, met with the secretary and then later had a follow-up discussion with him and uh, he obviously hadn't taken a position he hadn't even seen the bill but mm -hmm. generally was very supportive he's a former mayor he understands mm -hmm. local politics he was a governor of idaho he was a senator very very good guy and uh, i mean you don't do this because he's a good guy you have to follow the law and do different things so hopefully though uh, he, uh, at, at worst, will be neutral, at best would be supportive, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and hopefully not oppose the bill. So uh, we'll, we'll just have to see. I need to go step by step, getting co-sponsors, getting hearings if we need to, whatever we need to do. Right to put this on fast track to get it done this year. Very good. Congressman Buck McCain, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Ian. And thank you for joining us. If you missed any portion of this program, you can see it again and again on scvtv.com. Check back here, Channel 20, Sunday, 8.30 a.m., Thursday, 9 p.m., for another Newsmaker of the Week.